Welcome to our epic ocean, where critical solutions to a planet in peril are brought to the surface. Our epic ocean celebrates all that is epic about the ocean and why it is the planet's most vital resource. And now to our host, Rich Gurman. If you listen to this podcast or watch our YouTube channel, you already know that commercial overfishing on a global scale is a major problem for sustaining fish populations, which are in a major decline. I've interviewed many experts on the subject, including the legendary Dr. Sylvia Earle, Captain Paul Watson of Sea Shepherd, Louis Sahoyes, who directed The Cove and runs Oceanic Preservation Society, and Andy Sharpless, CEO of Oceana, each with their own understanding on how to help solve this problem. And of course, the documentary Seaspiracy exposed the issue to the masses. One thing all experts agree on, unsustainable fishing practices is one of the top issues facing the health of our ocean. A few years ago, after doing my own extensive research, I determined the number one action that any individual could take to help our planet was to stop eating animals. I even went onto Facebook and I wrote a post saying that converting to a plant-based diet was the best thing that one could do for their personal health, the welfare of the animals, and for the earth. A no-brainer based on both science and data. Except for a handful of vegan friends who liked the post, my statement was met with dead silence. Crickets. Hey, in a perfect world, nobody would kill and eat animals, but we don't live in a perfect world. With over 7.9 billion people currently inhabiting the earth, there are 14%, or about 1.1 billion, who are vegan or vegetarian. We have a long way to go to convert the unconverted, even though many of those who eat meat products of any kind are also animal lovers at heart. A strange dichotomy to comprehend. But what if there's a way you could still eat fish or meat products without an animal being harmed? And what if you could eat fish not contaminated with plastics, mercury, pesticides, or antibiotics, but still have the same experience and nutrition as the real thing? Well, now a biotech company from the San Francisco Bay Area is leading the charge to create a solution to the world's declining fish population problem. My guest today is Justin Kolbeck, who, along with his business partner, Aria Elfenbein, are the co-founders of Wild Type, a company producing cultured salmon from fish cells. Today, they are pioneering cellular agriculture to get the cleanest, most sustainable seafood on the planet and are hoping to reinvent how the world views and consumes meat in the 21st century. Justin, welcome to Our Epic Ocean. How are you today? I'm awesome. Thanks, Rich. How are you? I am awesome, and I'm excited to have you here. So let's just start with sharing with our audience what Wild Type is and why you guys decided to dedicate a good portion of your life to this very ambitious, ambitious and forward-thinking mission. We'll get into the how a little later, but first, what is the concept? Help us fall in love with cultivated salmon. All right. Yeah, six years in now. It has it has been a decent chunk of my life so far. Um, so our mission is to create the cleanest, most sustainable seafood on the planet. We can dive into, forgive the puns, since it's, a, <laughs> it's an ocean podcast. Might as well have some fun with that. Um, in, in, into what that means, maybe in a bit. Um, but what we do is we create what's called what we call cell cultivated seafood. Um, and the way it works, very basically, is we cultivate or grow, in our case, salmon cells, combine that with a plant-based backbone that we call a scaffold. And voila, um, you can get a pretty impressive, awesome piece of sushi-grade salmon um, that we've been getting input on for the last six years, really, from a, a whole range of culinary partners. And you know, the, the basic idea is to, coming back to our mission, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is to create a new form of seafood production um, that doesn't require wild caught fish, uh, either as the thing that we're directly consuming or as an input into, you know, farmed fish, let's say. Um, and that is free of all the things that we would rather not have in our seafood. So sea lice, um, parasites, mercury, microplastics, antibiotics, you name it. And, and that's really what we mean by cleanest. Um, and so, you know, really importantly, our, our goal is to not have fishermen stop fishing. Um, it's to maybe divert or add to or supplement uh, the, the different sources of seafood that are that are out there today. Because 
we, we're going to need something like 40 or 50 million more tons of seafood by the end of this decade. And I think it's a really big question about where the heck is that going to come from? So that's the real kind of synopsis version of what we're up to at Wild Type. Beautiful. And to you personally, why is this so important, not only to you, but also for the planet? Um, you know, I, I kind of found my way, stumbled my way almost into uh, food security as something that I cared about a little bit later in life. So I, I started off my career as a diplomat and worked in places like Pakistan and Afghanistan, where food insecurity is a real thing. Um, it's not just some, you know, not to diminish the importance here in the US, something like one in 10 people here in this country even probably could have more to eat or more nutritious foods um, or be in some way, shape or form food insecure. So it's substantial here. But in a place like Paktika province, Afghanistan, where I spent my last overseas assignment with the State Department, it's something that myself and my colleagues and the provincial governor spent time on all day, every day, pretty much. Um, and it really got me thinking about our food system in, in the big in the big scheme of things. And I got really worried, you know, what does our world look like 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, where we, when we maybe have 3 billion more people on the planet and they all want to eat like Americans in terms of the amount of animal protein that they're consuming, where the heck is it going to come from? And a, a dear friend and my co-founder, Aria, um, we've known each other for almost 12 years now. He had this idea that we could make the same meat and seafood that we're used to consuming, perhaps without that environmental price tag uh, that it that it comes with today. Um, and so that's really where the where the idea was born. You know, I think sort of my passion for solving this big food insecurity problem, Aria's passion for you know leveraging powerful science and technology to address big problems like sustainability, and um, that all collided into Wild Type about six years ago. Wow, what a fateful meeting. I want to hear uh, a little bit more about that meeting, but backing up to your travels, I mean, for you to experience food insecurity, maybe better said starving people, it sounds like it really kind of just lit something up inside of you and you wanted to do something about that problem, yeah? Yeah, you know, I um, until you see it, uh, it, it doesn't become visceral, right? And yeah. then, you know, I, I would spend, when I was in Afghanistan, um, multiple days a week uh, with our brave soldiers who would kind of take us out, me and, you know, other people. And we'd meet with people in the villages, like way outside of the base. And that was like the number one thing that people talked about. They're like, look, the reason people are signing up for the Taliban is because they're hungry and they need to like feed their family. And, you know, the Taliban's offering three hots and a cot, basically. Um, so it's, it was as simple as that, which I, you know, wow. you know I think when you extract away from, you know, uh, a, a, a conflict like that it seems complicated but to a lot of people it was really just you know what is how, how am i supporting my family in this kind of war-stricken economy that's that's so profound it, it reminds me of the somalian pirates these were hungry people trying to feed themselves and their families right and we make them out to be these awful people and um that's i never really thought about it the same analogy with the with the taliban that's super interesting um so let's let's go to that fateful meeting. I believe it was a, a dinner party where you met Aria back in was it 2011? Yep, 2011. You, um, yeah, we we met at a dinner uh, that a mutual friend had invited us to, and the the idea was that nobody knew each other. Um, mm. You know, as 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 we become adults, I think we become we just have less space for new friends. I think <laughs> for whatever reason, and that's really <laughs> been the case after having a couple of kids. Um, it's just not as much time. Yeah. Um, but for whatever reason, I was just, and I think Ari was too, and you know, in a very open-minded state that night, and you know, we connected about passions that we had for traveling, and he had spent a lot of time overseas, and I had just gotten back from overseas, and still had this great curiosity and interest in um, kind of the the bigger world, and um, yeah, we just became good friends, and over the years, we would talk about what we were doing in our professional lives, which were pretty different and distinct. And we came together over this idea originally, you know, it was in the middle part of 2016 when we first started talking about what would become wild type and then really got going and uh, we're coming up on our six years. Uh, so it's kind of October of 2022 is when, of uh, 2016 is when mm. we kind of started in earnest. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, um, well, seven years, shoot <laughs> before, before long. Um, 
Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been a long journey. And, and I think for the first year or so, it was just the two of us trying to convince ourselves that this could be a thing, right? <laughs> I think the first, the first impression, like when I told my mother about this, when I told my friends about this, they're like, especially back then when it wasn't as present in like the public imagination as it is today, people are like, wait, what, what, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, right. And, and then it's, it's interesting how quickly things move, right? Because since then, there's been like Seaspiracy and, you know, one documentary, David Attenborough documentary after the next. And there's this like building drumbeat that, you know, we need to start, let's say, if not fully changing our behaviors, modifying them at least a little bit so we can live mm-hmm. in slightly better harmony with, with our planet. Um, and so I think I don't really get the question anymore, like, Why? I think these days it's more like what and how are you going to convince me that this isn't totally weird and gross? And um, I've got a whole bunch of ideas we can talk about today about, about that exact topic. Um, but, I, like weird, but, I like weird and gross, so let's go there for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I mean, you, you know, I, I think a lot of people are kind of gravitate towards seafood because in, in a way it's this like very natural thing that a lot of us did as kids. You know, I used to go fishing as a kid, like, you know, I've filet of fish as a young kid and you're like out camping and it's in 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 a lot of ways a lot more proximate than how like a steak gets to your plate like unless you grew up on a farm chances are you weren't involved in processing a cow and have any idea of what's involved there that's right so i think like seafood uh, for better for worse is just closer to a lot of us um as sort of a you know as, as a source of protein interestingly i agree and i also think that and i i think I've done this in my own mind, we justify, well, we've all seen the slaughterhouse videos and how a pig is killed, a cow is killed, and that's just morally wrong, but at least the fish was out in the ocean when they were caught. It was, I think we just, we look at it different in some maybe twisted way, but I I absolutely, I hear what you're saying. Um, Back to your meeting with Ari real quick. So six years ago, like you say, this was a a brand new concept seemed kind of weird uh still to some people i think it does but i think because of everything going on in the world we're looking for a solution which is why i'm just glad to be talking to you to, about this um solution that you guys have and we're going to look at where it's, where you're taking it but how in, w- w- how did you guys go from your background his background as a cardiologist focused on stem cell research to l- actually pairing up and saying, let's partner on this and take on this unique and incredibly, as you will share, it's a very challenging endeavor. You know, it, it, um, it was, it was gradual at first. So we, you know, when things really started in the fall of 2016, we started applying for a space to do this kind of work. This isn't just something you can do like in your garage with like, (laughs) you know, a a few bucks and like a a craftsman bench. You need, you need a little bit more equipment. You weren't um, in your base, in your basement as you began. No, no. (laughs) Um, and so, you know, we, in a very fortunate accident kind of stumbled upon a co-working space made for biotech companies actually in San Francisco. Uh, At the time it was called QB3. Now it's called NBC Biolabs, and they allow you to rent. We actually just fully moved out of there last week, kind of the end of an era, interestingly. Oh, wow. um, we, um, you can rent a bench with all the equipment kind of there uh, on, a, on an hourly basis. And so starting in 2016 through most of 2017, we, it was just the two of us kind of testing ideas, um, trying to make sort of our very first product and showing and, you know, I think proving to ourselves that this would work at that time, Aria, I mean, this is kind of Aria's third job. He was working, um, more or less full time as a postdoc researcher at the Gladstone Institutes in San Francisco, um, working on super interesting heart cell biology. Um, mm. he, you know, I actually went to visit him and saw, uh, back when we were just friends, um, saw like a sheet of beating heart cells. Um, and even at the cellular level, heart cells have the ability, heart muscle cells have the ability to like pace make and you'll see them beating as if our heart does. I mean, it's like truly fascinating. Wow. Um, yeah. And you know, it's when you see things like that, it's like not that big of a leap to sort of being able to make something like fish meat or whatever. Um, anyway, he was also working as a cardiologist to kind of pay his rent, um, at night. <laughs> I do that uh, also and, when I need to. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, <laughs> but I mean, he's just, he's just very passionate about you know, being able to help people out and then w- working with me. And I was, you know, at the time working as a strategy consultant. Um, so we'd get together on nights and weekends and 
basically try to show that this could work and convince ourselves that, you know, A, this is technically feasible and, and B, we could come up with a proposition that made sense to a consumer. Um, you know, and, and I think that was the, the insight that I tried to bring in those early days was like, why would someone buy this? Mm-hmm. Um, right. Yeah. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Yes. Um, and, and, and I think really that first year we, we got our first prototypes done we showed that this could be done, and I think clarified our thinking about, our, you know, our future thesis about what would later become our initial products and like why we decided to focus on seafood in particular and why salmon. Um, so yeah, that's that's really kind of what those first years were look, looking like. So I mean, it was you know pre kids for me, um, so I had a lot more time on the nights and weekends to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, I was a better, generally better rested human being back then. <laughs> um, but yeah, and same same for Aria. I mean, it was a ton of fun, like in those those first few years when it was just us. So cool. So let's kind of bring it forward. I, I want to get into the technology behind Wild Type. Uh, first of all, you've successfully raised, I think, over $100 million to date, which makes you the leader in this now competitive field with a stellar group of investors and a solid team around you, no longer just the two of you. Can you explain the complicated process please. I, I believe it began with the cells of one tiny fish, right? So tell, yeah. tell us your fish story as it leads up to where you are today. Yeah. So our, our products do start with fish, right? So um, people ask us all the time, like, is this appropriate for vegetarians? And the answer is, well, it depends, right? So, <laughs> um, I mean, we didn't slay a fish um, approximately uh, to kind of create our, our sushi products, but a fish was sacrificed at one point. Um, so the basic idea is if um, if you find the right kind of cells, right, and they're stem cells, you've probably heard that term before, and all it really means is um, cells have a few really important qualities. Uh, first of all, they have a great youthful regenerative quality, right? So when organisms, including us, are young, and particularly in the embryonic phase, we are growing like crazy, Um and same thing goes for, for stem cells. Um, and importantly, uh, they can turn into different types of things, right? So mm-hmm. in a way, it's kind of like um, we're at the beginning of our college career, right? We can kind of choose our major and choose exactly what kind of profession we're going to pursue. Um, so if I want to become a chemical engineer, I can do that. If I want to become an architect, if I want to become a mechanic, the world's my oyster. Um, however, if I'm like, five years into the partner track at a law firm, chances are I'm probably not going to take one of those other career tracks, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing goes for stem cells. So if you find them at that right stage, they'll grow a lot and they can be able to turn into the different types of things that we need for meat and seafood. The trick though is keeping them in that youthful state. And so the the challenge is we understand really well how to cultivate human cells um, so we can you know, understand our own bodies and create therapeutics across a wide range of things. That's the entire bio pharma, uh, biomedical uh, space. Mm-hmm. We understand other model organisms um, like Chinese hamsters, interestingly, um, for vaccine production. We understand other mammals. It turns out we actually don't understand that much about seafood species. Um, mm. So things like salmon and tuna and crab and lobsters and whatnot. It just isn't studied anywhere near as much as... Uh, warm-blooded species um and so the first challenge we had to do is figure out how to keep those cells growing and happy and thriving um and so we had to just try a bunch of different things um to find this like nutrient mix the cell feed that kept those cells in that healthy state once we did that without any genetic engineering we we're actually able to keep the cells in this kind of like eternally youthful state hmm. and in a way it's a lot like a starter yeast for baking right um, we're, we're making salmon now from a fish that was harvested Christmas Eve of 2019. I think that's right. Maybe even 18. <laughs> Double check. Uh, it's been, it's been a while, right? Just like you can kind of inherit like a starter yeast from like your grandma, right? Um, it's the same, same idea. Now, once the cells are sort of in that state, um, we grow them in, uh, kind of a big beer vat, you know, to use a, a helpful analogy and it's a big stainless tank, um, got some paddles that sort of move the cells around with this, with this, uh, nutrient broth and the cells kind of happily grow until they sort of reach a maximum density. We remove the cells from that, that, uh, cell feed, 
concentrate them down and uh, lay them down onto a three-dimensional plant-based plant lattice that helps to give the final product, you know, the structure and, um, you know, to, to a large extent, even the appearance, the appearance of the yeah. finished product. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the product is not pure f fish, right? Because um, it does have this sort of, you know, plant-based um, component to it as well. Um, but in the end, I think, you know, in the long arc of this kind of industry, we can probably design scaffolds that will be fully consumed and remodeled by the cells. And, you know, in theory, it might be possible to have a completely indistinguishable fillet of salmon, let's say, from, from the animal. But we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, certainly a, certainly a work in progress. But that's the basic idea, right? And so what we get on the other side of that is, uh, and you can check out our website and Instagram and everything. You know, we've got countless photos of our product. You can kind of see what it looks like. Um, I think it's very good. Um, it's not perfect, um, but it's, I think, a really, really great alternative for people who are looking for something that's that maybe goes a little bit easier on our oceans than wild caught or farmed uh, seafood. I love it. Yeah, we'll share links to your website and social media for sure. How long did it take to produce that first sample, and how did it taste? I heard it was it was kind of a disappointment right out of the gate. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that first sample honestly we spent all of 2017 kind of making our, our real first prototype our first like real salmon prototype that we debuted um with a, a friend of ours in the restaurant world in portland oregon um we were so proud of it we had made like the first multi-pound batch of wild type salmon we had it prepared a few different ways by three different chefs um and i would say you know that the flavor was quite faint and the structure was not nearly as complex as it is today. Um, you know, and, and I think it's just worth noting that while uh, I think we're super proud of what we're doing, this is like a multi-decade journey that we're on mm. to you know, create the fidelity, the types of products that we know are possible, scale it up you know, to even begin making a drop in the giant ocean of seafood that's consumed every year globally. And most importantly, bringing our costs down so that you know, one day, the most nutritious foods will also be the most accessible, right? Mm. I have this dream about getting like a piece of salmon with all the same nutritional benefits that you find today, cheaper than a Big Mac. Cause wow. like, what, what, like what, what does that do to like this idea about cheaper foods being unhealthy, right? And addressing a ton of the public health crises that we have here in the United States. For sure. In fact, you're, you're uh, a question ahead of where I want to go. Cause I, I want to get into what it costs now and, which is not sustainable and how to make it sustainable. But going back to when you, you first created this, you spent a year doing it, and then the taste was um, pretty flat. How did you eventually get it to taste like delicious raw salmon? We were uh, Right before we went live, I was telling you how a mutual friend of ours has uh, eaten your salmon, and she's a total vegetarian, so for her to even try it was, it was kind of a big deal for her, and she said it was delicious. So how did you get it to taste good or is that the secret sauce that you don't want your competition to know? <laughs> um, look, it's, it's to the credit of our incredible R and D team. And the, the answer is it's been years of work, countless iterations. And I, I don't even know how many hours have gone into this product. I need to count that at some point, but, um, you know, I, I think, one of my biggest jobs um, ever since we started the company is just to find and recruit some of the finest scientists and engineers in this country and around the world. And we've been really fortunate to have some, some phenomenally talented science talent join us. And I think, you know, certainly, uh, you know, as a co-founder, I'm always thinking about tomorrow and where we could be if we just moved a little bit faster. But I have been constantly surprised how quickly we have overcome the many obstacles that have mm. come in our way that would have sunk the company, frankly. Um, like if we could have never created a good looking, tasty product, what's the point of all You're of done. this, right? You're done, yeah. Yeah. Um, and similarly, if, if we couldn't scale it up in a way, at least, you know, to be able to supply, you know, a handful of restaurants, again, what's the point, right? It just, it's going to be like a scene from Zoolander, right? Like a meal for ants. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, um, kind of cool for like a, you know, maybe a, any micro dining experience, but doesn't move the needle on these big problems that we started off by talking about. I'm, I'm glad you're saying that. And I, I knew you would based on how this whole thing started by you witnessing 
hungry people around the world, obviously to create this project, the uh, product for some, you know, rich people in the Bay Area, that's not going to, that's not going to do it for you. Um, and we'll get more into the scaling in a second, but I, I want to ask, because I think this is important for people to understand, how long does it take to go from cell to edible salmon? Uh, less than two months if we kind of have to start from a dead stop. Um, when we're at full tilt, I think it'll be probably closer to like two to four weeks. Which is fast um, compared super fast, to right? a sam growing a salmon in the ocean, right? Right. Yeah, multiple years. Yeah, even farming, um, you know, is much, much longer than that. So I think we've got some, some you know, and, and it's, I should have said this at the very beginning, you know, we're not making the whole fish. <laughs> we're making... Yeah, you know what? I'm glad you said that because I was, yeah, I, I made yeah. a mental note. Let's make sure people get, there's not eyes and a brain and everything else. It's just the edible part, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So we're making, and actually for our first product, which is a uh, salmon saku, which is, you know, the, the kind of rectangular piece that you see behind like a sushi counter mm -hmm. that is used to kind of slice off uh, sashimi pieces and nigiri pieces. And then the scraps are used for rolls. Um, you know, it's worth just thinking about the economics of that for a second, right? So let's say I was talking to one of our um, chef partners and just asking him about how the numbers work out in the sushi industry, right? So they get a fish, um, and let's just say for argument's sake, it's a 10 pound fish. Um, they throw away seven pounds of wow. fish in sushi. Now, obviously, that's like the highest grade, you know, there's the most picky. Mm -hmm. um, so all, off the bat, you're losing 70% of the weight, right? Which makes the fish that much more expensive. And then there's usually about an hour of trained sushi chef time to like break down that fish, um, which, you know, you're paying some in San Francisco, maybe 30 bucks an hour for, for that, right? Mm -hmm. So the end result is that the cost of the salmon really to the sushi restaurant is something like 60, 70, maybe even 80 bucks a pound. Um, which is why it's so expensive to get a sushi dinner. Um, yeah. and, and so we are not doing any of that. We're just going to give them the saku that would like sit right behind the, the bar, right? So there's no wasted yield uh, and there's no labor involved to break it down. You just take it out of the package, pop it behind Life your sushi counter and yeah. slice your pieces, right? Um, and, 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 I, and I think that is revolutionary for a lot of reasons. I mean, one, and the amount of waste that we're avoiding is colossally exciting second i think restaurants as it is operate on like razor thin margins so any chance to like save a little bit of busy chef time um you know to do the more higher margin activities let's say i think is, is, is has been really exciting to a lot of restaurants especially so, these days yeah exactly um and so uh, but that's well and good right like this is like elon musk working on the tesla roadster it's like great you know, people in sushi restaurants are able to get your product, but like, what about everybody else? And like, what, how does this scale? And so for the same reason, you know, I think we're starting in fairly low quantities as soon as we get to market high price point, because our, our process is more expensive than we would like it to be right now. Mm -hmm. Unsurprisingly, we haven't scaled, right? Mm -hmm. So everything's more expensive until you do. Uh, we're, we're very much in the process of doing that right now. But I think where this goes is, you know, highly automated, highly safe. You know, I, I, I kind of co-led this company through a pandemic, right? And I remember very clearly all of our meat processing plants in this country shutting down for a few months, right? And like panic about meat rationing at places like Costco. Like I, hopefully everybody listening to this podcast still remembers those days. We are living in this world where our food system is so delicate like i don't think we really appreciate just how a very small ripple can have a huge impact on our ability to kind of get the foods we want and so i think that left this huge impression on me to make a very resilient system that doesn't rely on having a bunch of people standing shoulder to shoulder and like you know 20th century 19th century meat packing plant style um for production and so long story short i think where we go from here is um smart automation scaling up um and you know, being able to create these products in a way that um, brings their price significantly down. I saw recently that an order of your sashimi nigiri cost, I think, forty dollars wholesale, wholesale, not retail, which clearly is not sustainable. So, how are you gonna how are you gonna make it more affordable? How long do you think it'll take? And 
kind of like we we're saying, you don't, you're not trying to create the Tesla Roadster. You want something that's going to be available for the masses, not just a luxury item. So, yeah, what has to occur, you know, and how long is it going to take? Yeah, look, I, I think part of the reason um, things have moved more slowly than I would like is that before, like Elon could sort of justify making the big plants needed to make like the Model 3 and the Model Y and then sort of eventually opening up all of these other competitors to kind of create an even cheaper version of his cars, right? Which mm -hmm. is the, the moment we are in for the electric vehicle uh, evolution. Um, we have to first prove out that this works because the facilities needed to kind of scale this up cost tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And although we've been fortunate enough to raise a little bit of capital, um, we don't have enough to be able to kind of produce something of that scale. And so we are in this world now where we kind of have to sort of step function increase, right? Sort of show that we can do it at a certain scale at a certain cost, prove the concept, show that there's great consumer interest and demand in products like ours, then justify sort of raising that next batch of capital, very specific to creating a facility, right? And and off we go from there. And, you know, and I think I'm using this electric vehicle analogy because I think that the arc of that innovation is very applicable here. Like I, I was in mm -hmm. high school when the, when the Prius came out in the nineties in LA. And I remember them driving around in the carpool lane with like a single driver thinking like, Oh man, like how do I get one of those? That's pretty awesome. I mean, <laughs> ever spend any time in Southern California. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but I, I also remember like they were so clunky that car, right? It was not an impressive vehicle really in any way, but here we are now, um, 25 years later, and we're talking about the death of the internal combustion engine, right? States like California going full electric by 2035. I think mm -hmm. GM and others have sort of put a stake in the ground that after that year, everything will be electric. Um, that's a massive change. And honestly, if you had asked me when I was younger, like when I was in high school, would we ever see the end of the internal combustion engine? I would have laughed. Um, and, and, I, and I think we're in that same moment for the, the Prius moment for alternative proteins mm -hmm. where they're kind of interesting, they're cool, but what's most exciting about them is that I think you can see the arc of, of where we're headed, right? And I think things are moving a little bit faster. Um, you know, in our, in our invest, last investor round in our series B, we had a lot of interest from big food companies. Mm. Um, you know, and I, I always admired Tesla because their mission was not to sell electric cars. Their mission was to catalyze the transition to the electric economy, mm. right? And they've done that, right? In a, in a way, they've actually very successfully created so much competition for themselves that they've achieved their mission while probably lowering their margins a little bit. And and, and it, I, I think, you know, for, for a company like Wildtype, that would be an amazing outcome. Like I would love to have so much competition and so many sustainable options, let's say 15, 20 years from now than we would have today, whether it's being produced by a company like Cargill um, or Tyson or a small startup like ours that eventually grows into being a bigger company. Um, so, so that, that's the journey that we're on. And, you know, I, I just, while I think the next few years are going to be super exciting when these products are actually finally hitting the market and you can get them in restaurants and, you know, over the next five years, maybe get them in grocery stores in a limited capacity. I think where things really start to get interesting is kind of 10 or 20 years out from now. I think the electric car analogy is so spot on pretty much every major car maker is now putting out electric cars. And eventually, to your point, that might be all we have, hopefully. And uh, maybe in the next, what, five, ten years, we'll see the Tyson Foods of the world doing the same thing, having a wing of cell-based chicken or fish or whatever it might be, and then eventually it could, it could take over. So I think your, your timing, you know, it's, it, you're hitting that tipping point moment, and um, I like how you call it the Prius moment. That's good. And hopefully, I, I think you and I are probably the same in that we – we, we see the challenges that the planet and the ocean is facing, and we want to make it happen yesterday because we know it's important. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, you want it to happen fast, but unfortunately things, things take time. And actually, that's a good, a good time to go into the, the support that you've garnered. Uh, as we talked about, you've received, you're, you called it, I think you called it maybe a, a little bit of funding, but I would call over 100 million pretty serious funding from some big name, high net worth individuals such as Leonardo DiCaprio, Jeff Bezos, uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s, I think it's foot, foot, uh, Footprint Coalition. Yep. These guys are all betting and gals on your ability to scale. We, we should keep a 
a counter of all the ocean and fish references we're using in this interview. But they're betting on your ability. Up to 10 at least. I think, yeah, at least. We'll have a little ticker in the corner. Um, but these people are betting on your ability to scale wild type, pun intended. First of all, how did you, oh, here comes number 11, how did you lure in these, in, I mean, these are influential backers. Um, part of it, I think, is the moment that we're in. It, you just can't not think about the climate crisis in 2022. And if somehow you avoid doing that, I, I mean, congratulations. It's not, not, an, easy, not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, I, I think the most like poignant demonstration of that was like David Attenborough's most recent documentary where he like talks about his life and just the changes he's seen and, you know, the relatively short time he's been on this planet over his lifetime. Like as a tripling of the population and things I like mean, that. I yeah. mean, just like astounding, right? You, you just can't ignore it. And, and, and I think, you know, investors, consumers, everybody is just looking for something to do, right? Um, I'll give you an example. When I was in Australia, this was 10 years ago, um, there, they were and are in, you know, as bad of a drought as I think we are in California. Mm -hmm. And the state government in Victoria were handing out these little hourglasses. It was like a three minute hourglass with a suction cup and you'd hop in the shower and you'd like flip it over. And when that, when the sands ran out, it was time to stop your shower. Right? So the idea was like, use less water. Here's a very small, tangible thing that everybody can do every day. And like, when you think about the climate crisis, it's just so big and overwhelming that it's like, where do you even begin? Um, you know, you get these big movements, like stop eating meat. Well, Meat's really good. And I think a lot of people have that tied up into their culture. And it's not so easy just to kind of flip a switch and go to fava beans, right? That's right. Um, all day, every day. Or like, don't drive anymore. Well, you know, maybe you like to go on, you know, backcountry trips and like a electric car's not going to get you there just yet, right? Um, and, and so I, I think the moment that we're in is, you know, us and so many other companies are actually providing small things that people can do, very tangible things, right? It's like, Maybe my one night at sushi this month, I'm like not going to eat that wild caught fish and I'm going to try wild type and maybe I don't hate it. <laughs> and, you know, maybe that becomes my new go-to. And I like the idea that it doesn't have any mercury in it. I like the idea that it doesn't have any antibiotics, right? I like the idea that I don't have to like freeze the thing to kill all the parasites that we know are in it. Um, and, and maybe it sticks. And, and, and so I, I think, you know, we're able to reel them in uh, because that's that's where people are right now, right? They're looking for things that they can do. And <laughs> I think it's just so exciting across not just what's happening in food, but what's happening in just kind of climate tech more broadly that there are five, 10 years from now, you're going to have a hundred things that you can do every single day to kind of start mm. chipping away at these behavioral changes that, that will be needed to live in harmony with with earth i like that and i caught the real the r-e-e-l reference there that was number 12. um yeah th i think that's great i think people are two things it could be a bit of an ego play like hey i'm eating wild type salmon instead of wild caught and hey i'm okay with that and um i think people are looking for like you're saying how can i make a difference i think mm -hmm. people feel frustrated if they can't make a difference and if they could do little things in their life like eat your food versus wild caught fish or farm fish and drive an electric car or use less single use plastics or whatnot. At least they feel they're part of the solution versus just adding to the problem. Um, I'm curious as, as a business owner, people like DiCaprio and Bezos, they under, like you're saying, they understand the crisis that we face as a species, as a planet. How do you navigate the energy, the, the tension, if you will, between wanting to provide a return on investment to your investors with the mission of trying to do the right thing for the ocean and the planet, knowing that this is a complicated process that's going to take time, more time than you and I would like. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'll give you a very real life example that we're thinking about right now. <clears throat> so we're building um, a second facility in San Francisco that will be done relatively soon. Um, and a third one we're starting to scope. Um, it's in a different state. Uh, we've got a site picked out. And we don't want to build a facility that's going to have a heavier environmental footprint than conventional seafood, whether wild caught or, or farm fish. 
And so we selected a place that will have 100% renewable energy by probably the closer end of, the, of this decade, but we're like very close to it now, mm-hmm. almost 100%. Um, and we're starting to think about like rainwater, right? It rains a lot in this place. Could we, and we have a very water intensive process, could we harvest our own water mm-hmm. and either filter it and use it for our process? It's probably almost enough um, to make a decent dent, at least in our water use. But then we get to this difficult place where it's like, yes, but that's like a few extra million bucks. We don't have any revenue yet. Can we really justify that as like a good investment in this moment? And that right there is the sort of dilemma that you're talking about, right? On one hand, we have a, we were formed with this environmental mission, right? That is who we are. Um, But at the same time, can I justify, you know, a relatively untested technology that might cost our investors millions of dollars, um, too early right and 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 so i i I mean in general i think we've kind of had to go it alone mentality we haven't really relied on any kind of government support or you know philanthropy dollars or anything like that but i think maybe this is the moment now where Hmm. those kind of programs can supplement private investment um so this next kind of wave and it's not just wild type right it's like beyond meat and impossible and all these other plants Um, where we could really green them to the next generation. It's not just like LED certification. It's like net zero uh, usage of resources, whether it's water, electricity, whatever. Um, That that is like a super interesting, I think, fertile area for maybe some public-private partnership. I like that. I'm curious to these investors who are not just people that get it uh, regarding the environment, and obviously they're – they have a lot of money and influence behind them. Do they have any input and influence on the day-to-day of the company? Like you call upon them, uh, like a board of directors, if you will, asking these kinds of questions. Yeah, we um, we do. I mean, we have a very active board of directors of uh, investors, and I bug them all the time <laughs> about random things. Um, a lot of them have seen dozens, uh, if not scores, of companies kind of come and go, and they've just learned a lot from that process, and I – really rely on their counsel a lot um and then we've got other investors um you mentioned robert downey jr's footprint coalition um that we work on very kind of specific uh narrow things like how do we how do we talk about this these products in a way to get people excited about them right and you know he robert is very good at this kind of stuff his team is amazing at thinking about how do we like humanize this stuff um and, and make it appealing and interesting and dynamic. And, you know, so, so I think like different pockets of our investors, we kind of tap into them for different reasons. Um, personally, I love, you know, I think I'm an operator at heart, but I really love spending time thinking about brand for something like this. Um, and, and how we get people over that weirdness hump into actually trying our products. Will these high profile, uh, profile people, will they help create content to eventually help the marketing and branding for your vision and the future of the food? Has that been talked about? Ideally, yeah. That would be great, right? <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about- I just, I just, on that note, I actually just saw something that Robert Denny Jr. did with uh, one of the secretaries, I can't remember, it might've been Energy, uh-huh. um, where he was like, and the two of them, you know, he's obviously very smooth and the, you know, the, the politician was a little bit, a little bit more stilted, let's say. <laughs> it was like this LinkedIn ad where they're like trying to drive more people to apply to these jobs, right? At uh, whatever the government agency was. Um, I mean, it's amazing that he's like spending his time in celebrity to like, in the, in this case, drive jo- like green climate jobs um, in kind of core sectors of the government. Um I mean, I, I think, you know, we are forever grateful to people like him and Leonardo and others who have kind of put their celebrity to such a powerful, important use. Oh, 100%. I saw you had Adrian also on your show. Right. You know, we've kind of talked to talked to him, Grenier, um, over the years about what he's doing with Lonely Whale and um, some, some cool collaborations, hopefully. Hey, it helps. Anyone that can get the word out, right? That's what we need. Yeah. So let's let's go back to the competition a little bit. Um, a little more specifically, you kind of shared your philosophy, which I think is noble that you're that you look at competition as a a good thing for the the greater cause. Hopefully, it'll also not impact your business in a negative way. The competition hasn't really seemed to hurt Elon's uh, wallet too bad, right? He's doing pretty good. Mm. Um, Blue Nalu has raised, I believe, about eighty-four million dollars and is creating mahi mahi in a similar fashion to you. 
and there's other companies cultivating oyster meat, lobster, and crab. Uh, Finless Foods has cell cultured tuna. Uh, talk a little bit more. Are you, are you hoping this competition is healthy and creates a market for your seafood adjacent options? Do you think some of these companies are going to go away, like we've seen some of these you know, big tech companies that are huge for, they have their moment and then they just don't make the cut? What do you, what do you see yeah. happening there? On, on that specific thing, I don't know. I mean, it's it's so hard to it's so hard to tell. It's really early. Like nobody's got products in market yet, right? Um, but what's really interesting about seafood versus, let's say, chicken, is that there's kind of just like one chicken that everybody eats, right? Unless you're at some like special <laughs> heirloom chicken farm, right? Like, Good point. It's chicken, right? Or turkey, or you know, a little bit of differentiation with certain types of beef, right? Like Neiman Ranch, for example, like there is some branding and some differentiation. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, a little bit with, with pork and maybe some like more heirloom. But for the most part, it's beef or pork or chicken or turkey. With seafood, it's what, a hundred different more sea creatures that we eat on a regular basis, everything except jellyfish. Easily. Um, maybe people eat jellyfish. I don't know. Um, so first of all, there's room for a hundred more companies than there would be in the ter kind of terrestrial counterparts. And then for each species, maybe there should be a handful of companies working on some alternative to that, right? To really make a, make a dent. So that means maybe like three or 400 companies wouldn't be crazy. Like eel, for example, nobody's working on eel. Eel is basically impossible to farm. Um, as far as I know, nobody even understands how eels reproduce. <laughs> So you have to like catch baby eels and you raise them in captivity. And that's like, you know, eel ranching, essentially not all that different from bluefin tuna ranching, right. bluefin tuna ranching. I mean, it is like very basic practices that we, that we're doing. I don't think anybody would argue that, you know, this is sustainable in, in any way. Um, nobody's working on eel as far as I know, maybe they are. Um, and you know, that, that could go for pretty much every other type of seafood that we're eat, eating. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there just is a lot of room and I don't know, I maybe uh, I'm just sort of like a competitor at heart, but I always work harder and better when there's kind of someone on my heels um, and I like run a bunch of times a week and sometimes I like somebody like I hear them coming up behind me and, you know, I'm just like, no, I'm like, I'm not getting laughed by you. Like, you know, there's just like something intrinsically human nature about like wanting to compete and win and, sure. and so i think i think the busier the, the market space the better i i like that and hey if i were you and i had raised that kind of capital you i probably wouldn't be sleeping as much right i, I would be focused 24 7 on how can i make this pay off like you you have a lot on the line here um no doubt about it Let, what about um I'll, another good pun i know you caught that one too that was an accident by the way <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> That one was an accident. Um, let's talk about plant-based fish as another alternative. You've got Good Catch offering plant-based tuna. Ocean Hugger Foods has developed uh, plant-based raw tuna. New Wave Foods has come up with plant-based shrimp. Uh, restaurants are starting to offer plant-based sushi. What do you think about this movement? Yeah, I, I, it's great. I, I think, you know, I kind of got that. 40 to 60 million tons a year number in my head. Um, I mean, for us to even do a million tons by the end of this decade is going to create this Herculean effort, right? Where's the other 59 going to come from, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like, it, it's got to be all of the above. Um, you know, we've got to produce conventional seafood more efficiently. We have to create alternatives way faster and at way bigger scale. Um, I just, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm alone here, but I just see these alarm bells ringing when you look at the sort of state of our wild fish populations, right? They're not going up. Um, and if you look at the longer arc, right, where in the seventies, we were kind of in equilibrium today, we've got something like a third to a half, uh, of seafood being harvested in a, at unsustainable levels globally. Um, and you know, the, the, the trajectory is going down. It's not going the other way. So unless we want an ocean of jellyfish um, by the middle part of the century or end of the century, and I don't think anybody wants that, uh, jellyfish don't taste very good. Um, and certainly, you know, our oceans, which are our planet's biggest carbon sink by far, like 90 plus percent, do, are, the, are those oceans going to work well if we 
remove all of the sea creatures from them? I don't think so. Um, and, and so I just like, we're spending a lot of time thinking about cows burping, which is great. That's a big, important problem. We need to work on it. Um, but there's this massive one in our oceans that we are not, as a global community, yelling loudly enough about. I know people like Sylvia Earle has been uh, for her whole right. esteemed career. Um, and, you know, David Attenborough and others, you know, the kind of conservationists. And I hope, you know, their magnifying or their, uh, their megaphones will grow and more people will start to listen. I think they are. Um, if you would have started this mission 25 years ago, they would have all mm. thought you were crazy. And now I think people are starting to get it. And uh, as time goes on, I hope, uh, as I always say in the show, and this is why we created this show, we, we no longer have the luxury of time. And I think that mm -hmm. we're truly in an all hands on deck moment, which is why I wanted to talk to you because you guys are offering such a great solution, a complicated one, but it's, it's, it's a must. Like we said, we're not going to, it's not realistic for 8 billion to 10, 11 billion, like you said, add three more billion to it in the next several decades. The world's not going to have this great epiphany moment and just become vegetarian. I don't see that happening. So no. We need these alternatives. In fact, I want to talk. I want to kind of shift gears a little bit, and I think it'll take us into the bigger vision of why you are actually doing uh, what you're doing at a deeper level. You, you're collaborating with the Conservation Fund in an effort to mm. protect Bristol Bay in Alaska, which is the world's largest wild salmon fishery. There is a proposed copper and gold mine that threatens to destroy this critical habitat. So let's talk about that. How would this project impact both the salmon habitat and the Alaskan natives in that region? Yeah, um, there are a lot of jobs uh, <laughs> and a great deal of biodiversity in that bay. Um, you know, in this, this pebble bay, uh, the, this pebble mine um, that's been swirling now for many years, um, threatens to ruin that, right? There's been many independent studies that have shown that if that does come to pass, um, that the huge deposit of, let's say, sockeye salmon principally that are in that bay um, would be imperiled. So, um, I, you know, the fishing industry in that part of Alaska is in the billions of dollars a year, right? And hundreds, if not thousands of jobs, once you consider like everybody sort of downstream of the fishermen, mm -hmm. um, and we would lose this incredible, beautiful natural resource that we have in this, you know, last remaining bastion of wild fish. Um, how many, how many more wild fish populations do we want to decimate? Right? We, you already can't get Atlantic salmon; it's endangered, and um, it's just if you eat Atlantic salmon, it's farmed, right? Yeah. Hopefully, um, we've ruined that one. We've like seen fisheries on the eastern seaboard of this country collapse, whether it's cod or other things um, over the years. And, you know, this, this to us felt so important that we, we didn't want to, you know, take the chance of it coming to fruition. And I think this is a moment where we are, could not be more aligned with, you know, kind of conventional fishermen. Um, you know, and when we've been, I, Ari and me and others have been out on boats with fishermen many times over the last few years. And I think we are both conservationists at our heart, right? If we don't protect these wild fish populations, they don't have a living. And we don't have healthy biodiverse oceans that can perform the function that we need them to on this planet. So, so that was that was the basic idea, you know. And, and you know, as you said, we were, we have been so fortunate to have um, the, the financial support of you know fairly wealthy people with kind of a powerful megaphone, and we thought we could help um, because of that. Uh, you know, maybe tap into some some of their celebrity to help get the word out about this important initiative and protect that those jobs and protect that that habitat I, I think it's beautiful it speaks to me the bigger reason that you're doing this watch you guys are business people you're an entrepreneur of course you want to make money you need to make money to keep this business going and keep everybody happy around you but that's kind of secondary right to the real reason it's your care for for everything, for the fish, for the for the planet, for the the indigenous people in Alaska and around the world, so I I commend you for that, man. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, we're um, very much in a support role here. This effort has been underway. Um, in particular, the Native Corporation on the Bristol Bay has been leading the charge. There's a great <clears throat> um, article, opinion piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago. I would encourage everybody to go out and read if you haven't seen it. Um, I need to find the name of the author. It's not a not the tip of my tongue, um, 
but you know this this effort's been underway for a long time and we thought we could maybe just help at least tip tip this one effort mm -hmm. over the finish line a little bit faster i'm making a note I'll, I'll let's make sure we get the link to that article we can share with everybody yes yeah. as you're talking about this i I, I wrote this thing that I haven't shared publicly yet just a couple of days ago. I was, as you know, I paddleboard with dolphins, not only dolphins, but whales and talk about Alaska. We have a gray whale migration. The gray whales basically live up there in Alaska and they migrate all the way to Mexico to have their babies and to get to Mexico. They, they pass where you are in San Francisco and right here in Laguna Beach. Uh, but what I wanted to bring up real quick, I was paddling just a few days ago. And there was a, right off the coast here this huge bait ball, and there was a bunch of mm. common dolphins feeding on this bait ball. And I've observed this hundreds of times in the last 12 years because I'm out there every single day. And what I observed was that the dolphins will all work together, and they'll swarm around the bait ball, and they'll feed on it, and they'll feed on it for like two minutes. And then they leave. And they go to the next bait ball, and they'll feed on that for a couple of minutes, and then they, they, they just keep going. And I, I, the comparison in my mind was, what would we do if a bunch of humans came <laughs> on, on, on that bait ball? Would we just take two minutes worth of fish and then move on? Or would we just destroy the entire bait ball, just destroy the entire ecosystem? So I think the answer is obvious. Yeah, it's like a and, Las, Las Vegas buffet line, oh, I, I think, is your answer yeah, there. Yeah, there you go. So. And the moral to my, my story, which I'll, I'll share at some point, was um, we can learn a lot from these dolphins to, to really understand it. And, and hopefully we will begin to before it's too late. Um, okay, moving on. Some questions. I'm curious. Do you feel that you can turn this into a global phenomenon and eventually become the new norm for seafood levels? What's, what's the big sexy vision, if you will? Yeah, I do. So, you know, part of the reason we pick seafood is that it, it's the number one source of protein for the human species. Um, and we, from the beginning, wanted to be a global company. And so as we've, you know, for now, we're just focused 100% on the United States. That's our home market. Um, that's where we, that's where we'll launch. Um, mm -hmm. Frankly, that's where 99.9% .9 of my energy is on every day. A little bit, though, is thinking toward the future. And I think for us, like a lot of other companies um, in alternative proteins in seafood, you know, we're, we're thinking about Asia since that's where, you know, and, and also markets like Brazil, by the way, which, you know, is one of the biggest uh, sushi markets in the world, interestingly. Um, mm. You know, so so there are some exceptions to that, but that that's where we kind of think about going next, right? And so obviously places like Japan, there's a huge market for products like this. It is really interesting to think about how what how folks will react to this in different countries, right? Um, I think a Brazilian sushi lover would probably have a very different reaction to this than the Japanese one, um, probably. What do you think so, how do you think they'll react in Japan? Uh, my initial reaction was, they eat some weird things there. I think they might at least try it and be open to it. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, su sushi is this like amazingly evolving thing, right? I mean, it sort of started out in kind of feudal Japan with curing uh, fish in, in a certain way to kind of get it to last longer, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's since evolved countless times. Why, why couldn't or shouldn't this be another iteration or, you know, kind of take on that i mean i think a lot of people when they think about japan it's just like monolithic traditional place yes. but that's just not true right it's um just like anywhere else like very diverse and it depends on who you talk to and what their interests are and you know, japan is obviously a very tech forward nation mm -hmm. um and so who knows i i actually don't know i haven't spent a lot of time talking to people in japan about um about this but it, it is fun to think about like where where we go next and where our next partners are um uh, but yeah, I, I think ge generally speaking, you know, the next, the next steps for wild type are in Asia. Yeah, that's it'd be very interesting. Like you said, 99.9% .9 of your, your brain power is focused on the U S but as I'll, I'll be watching this unfold. I'm curious, uh, how it's received in, in, uh, in Asia. What's the plan by the way, to expand beyond salmon? You know, we are taking cues from our culinary partners, you know, launch partners, restaurants that we talk to on a regular basis and getting feedback from them on what is what's most important for us to work on. And, you know, I think the feedback we're getting is focus on those things that are the least sustainable. Um, so like bluefin tuna is an obvious yeah. one that people talk about all the mm -hmm. time, but there's countless other types of seafood that are 
challenging. Um, <laughs> somebody recently was like, please make me another version of crab that's not surimi. Um, <laughs> you know, so like a California roll could be good again. Mm -hmm. um, things like that. I think we're just, we're, we just kind of got our ear to the, to the ground listening to, to what people are telling us. And obviously uh, companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible have made a big impact in the alternative meat categories. Uh, what do you see being done in the red meat cell based niche and are there any plans for you to move into that niche or I'm, I'm assuming from what you're saying you have your hands full with fish at the moment yeah our nets are full that's right <laughs> um it's i we don't have any plans to sort of focus on terrestrial animals i think we're you know very much kind of driven by by the missions of, of our oceans and our waterways um but there, and there, there is really exciting stuff going on there. Like some of the products I've seen, like miniature full ribeye steaks with like marbling and whatnot from a company called Aleph uh, and Israel and, and others, um, you know, kind of like fully formed chicken skewers uh, that look like something you just find at like a street market somewhere. It just looks incredible. I can't wait to try it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we are, we are we are pretty focused on on seafood for the foreseeable future. For sure. Any plans to uh, take the company public? How long do you see that happening? Ooh, uh, you know, I I think it just maybe I'm old fashioned, but I feel like you need to be turning a profit before you start talking to investors about going public. <laughs> and so that's that's kind of where, detail, where my mind is. Just in detail. Is, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Sell a product for more than it costs you to make it. Um, that's. That's that's kind of that's, that's where my head and energy is right now. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, look, eventually, I think what we'd like to do with Wild Type is to create, you know, a big, successful, independent company of the size and scope of Tyson one day. Can be done, and the world needs it. So, a few more questions. Very important one next. How can I sample this product and maybe even take a tour of your facility? I'm not that far from you. That's true. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you're up in San Francisco, give me a call. Um, you know, it's easier, uh, easier when you're in town. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think in general for, for most people, I, you know, what we'd like to do, we are, we have a little tasting room now that's appended to our very modest pilot plant, mm -hmm. which is small. Um, we're opening a much bigger one, hopefully next year, uh, early part of next year. Um, and as soon as we have that, green light from FDA to be able to commercialize this, we're actually going to have tastings uh, on our own facilities, which is nice. cool as well as so, but the short answer to your question is we are running a hundred miles an hour every single day to get ready to release these products and sell them. So while, while it's kind of fun to like do a little private tastings at wild type, I think we're a lot more interested in getting it out into restaurants. And so our, our plan is to launch in you know one or two restaurants initially, and then to expand it from there um, as soon as possible. Amazing. What well, what would you say is the number one thing you've learned as uh, an entrepreneur in this complicated process? Oh. Well, I and for anybody whose background is in science, this is going to be abundantly obvious to you. But science is about failure, right? For every success you have, there are dozens of failed of, of failures and, and i think when you compound that equation over the five or six years that we've been at this right um that's a lot of failure and i think keeping the energy high among our team and keeping everybody kind of fixed on that on that goal that we're all very dedicated to working to i mean there's not a single person at the company that isn't um super passionate about our mission whether it's like for the oceans and for the environment, for better products, for health, or even just for the the interest of the scientific pursuit, mm -hmm. um, people are super passionate about what we're doing. And but I think it's fair to boil it down. It's just taking care of our people, um, checking in with them regularly, giving them the tools and resources they need. I mean, I, you know, interestingly, I think in my role these days, it's really about. In some ways, it hasn't changed. I think my number one job is to get great people into the company still, um, which you've done, you know, take care, take care of them. Um, so that they can kind of persist through the regular challenges and failures that we face every single day. Um, and then make sure we don't run out of money. <laughs> kind of feel like that's, 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 that's kind of my job. Um, you know, at the center of all that is our people. So I, you know, I think that's probably the biggest thing that's 
that's been on my mind, uh, which is why like when companies had a, have a head of people, I'm like, well, why aren't the founders doing that? Isn't that their main job? Um, yeah, anyway, that's kind of how I think about so it. So logical follow-up question to that. If your main role among several is keeping all your people motivated and on point when there's quote unquote failures. It remind, when you said that, it reminded me when I was a kid, I used to love Thomas Edison. And they said, you know, you failed 10,000 times at trying to invent the light bulb. You know, how do you deal with that failure? He's like, I haven't failed at all. I just found 10,000 ways that don't work. And I'm right. pretty sure he figured it out in the end. Um, my question though, if, if you're, it, it, I've been there, it takes a lot of energy to, let's say, hold these people up in a challenging mm. situation, how are you, who's holding you up? Like, what are you doing on a daily basis to take care of yourself? You know, for me, running is meditation. I think that that helps. And it's also like a great stress reducer. Um, I don't live as close to the coast as you, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd probably be in the ocean a lot more, um, even if it attacks me from time to time. <laughs> Hold <laughs> on, you got to tell people what you mean by that. <laughs> oh, yes. So my, my, fa my uh, dad had a little family reunion in Long Beach, California, and I, uh, went for a long run and then jumped in the ocean with my brother and stepped on a stingray that took a decent gash out of my foot and poisoned me for a solid two hours of agony. Um, if that ever happens to anybody, soak it in hot water. That's Don't let anybody pee on you. <laughs> don't go look for vinegar. Just, just pass, on, pass, pass on that knowledge. Uh, the lifeguard luckily had some good tips for how to treat it. And it's just uh, as hot a water as you can stand. <laughs> just grin and bear it. So back to the question, you um, run. Yes. Back to the question. Meditate. Um, you know, honestly, I, I, it's, it's my family, yeah. you know, I have, um, two kids and an incredible spouse and partner. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and I, I think every time I see them and we have a meal, I just think about like, we got to do better. Right. Like I, I go, I like, I want to give my fit, my kids seafood and the options I have at my grocery store leave a little bit to be desired. Right. I mean, even if we had no other problems, there's this like seasonal problem of seafood, right? If you want like fresh seafood and it's out of season, well, too bad. <laughs> like, right. So I, I, I think just having a, a couple three-year-olds just gives me this limitless sense of energy. Mm -hmm. And I, my, I think mission aligned passion has only grown as I've learned more about the big, the big issues that our oceans are facing over the years. You know, I think when we, when we started off, I, I think my mission energy was coming from these like really big picture kind of global things that were informed by my time as a foreign service officer. Mm -hmm. Now it's like very granular. Um, like I know exactly the major issues that our oceans are facing and I really want to help. Um, so yeah, I think it's probably a combination of those two things. Are these twins that you have? I have twins. Oh my God. Yeah. So I, it's funny. I, I'm like, he's going to, probably talk about running because I know you run, but it, it probably boils down to those two, three-year-olds. Honestly, I think it's a little terrifying, the thought of bringing children into this crazy world. So you're looking at what's the world you want to leave behind for these kids, right, as they grow up. Yeah, I've got this distinct memory. When they were small enough to carry, my wife and I were walking around downtown Seattle um, you know, with them in front and these little baby carriers. And uh, it was around Earth Day, and somebody had stuck up a, a piece of cardboard and in green marker had written like, what are you doing about the climate crisis? Um, this was in 2019. And I remember just feeling really good, right? Cause like when my kids are old enough to ask me that question, I'm actually gonna have an answer for them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm, I don't think I'm ever gonna, I'm not ever gonna forget that. I love that. It gave me chills, man. Well, that's a perfect ending point right there. Justin, I really appreciate you. I'm, I'm dead serious. I'll definitely make a trip up to the Bay. I'd love to meet you yeah, and Ari in person and, and just hang out and, and check out your facility and, and definitely sample the food. Um, what is the two real thing, two things real quick, best way for people to follow what you guys are up to in the progress would be to what? Yeah. So um, you can join our wait list. It's on our website, wildtypefoods.com. All of our social handles are wild type foods. You can check out um, what we're doing. Um, and, you know, if, if you feel moved to contribute a little bit to the conservation funds, amazing yes. efforts to kind of protect this piece of land in perpetuity. Um, you know, I spend a great deal of my free time at national parks and I'm so thankful that as a nation, we set those things aside for those places aside for yeah. ever. 
Um, so I think there's nothing bad that whether you're a sportsman or just somebody who likes to hike, you know, kind of preserving our wild natural places. And that is what the conservation fund does. So, um, you know, if you'd like to contribute, you can certainly reach out to us. We'd love to. Kind of yeah. We'll share links to everything. Last thing, final thought, final words from you. I, I think when we started, it was from a place of depression and despair like there's no way we're going to turn this ship around. But as I was just like looking at the people that have been on this podcast, I am, I feel like I'm in a uh, very good company of you know, people who are in a, in very concrete ways in so many different ways, doing something about, about the climate crisis in particular, as it pertains to our oceans. And yeah, I guess parting thoughts is there are, countless entrepreneurs probably out there listening that are ready to start something, whether it's in business or in the social, you know, in the social sphere with a nonprofit, um, get out there and do it. I mean, I think if every single person did something like, like that, you know, we'd have a huge dent in five, 10, 15 years. I'm really glad you said that because one, I wanted to have you on here to talk about what you guys are doing. Cause it's amazing. The second ancillary reason was if just one entrepreneur who's got what they think might be a crazy idea that you had six, seven years ago, which has now become kind of mainstream. If you can motivate them to go take a similar action in whatever niche they're in, then, then this is an hour of our time well spent. And the last thing totally. I'll say is I started this podcast out of that same despair. Uh, it was partly selfish. Like I love this ocean and these mer mm -hmm. the marine life so much that I, like, I need to do something. And talking to these amazing people, including yourself, gives, gives me hope. And my, my hope is that it gives our audience hope for the future. So Justin, yeah. you're amazing, man. Can't wait to meet you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That is our show, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. And we will see you next time. Have a good one.